I'm very pleased to be here today for this session, which is the out of the press sessions followed by a table talk. And I'm very pleased because I'm here with my team, um, which is spread around the world. And hopefully one day we will meet face to face again. Um, but it's a lovely session to be here with them today. And thanks, Katie, for the introduction. Camilla, the co-coordinator of the Alliance, is also here with us uh, today. She will be helping me out facilitating this session. So welcome, everyone. Um, we um, lovely production team was uh, with us throughout the annual meeting. We'll share now a link like to a quick question <laughs> in the chat. And um, I want to know if you know how many working group and task forces there are within the Alliance. So let's see. Um, click on the link and tell me <laughs> how many do you think there are? How many working group and task forces? Let's see. I'll just give it a quick second and then I'll respond. I'll give you the, the answer. Aha, uh -huh, see, responses, answers are, are coming through slowly and steadily. Huh? Interesting. I'll give a few more seconds. <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm seeing, um, it's, it's interesting to see you all, uh, you know, interacting with this, um, with these quick questions. But, um, Great. Let me give you the, the let me give you the answer. I don't wanna uh, I don't wanna take more of the time because we have quite a packed agenda. So it's four working group and seven task forces. You know, it's not about the numbers. It's just basically to remind you all that the alliance is made of all these different components. But we are all very happy to be talking to you all all the time. So do reach out if you need additional information to any of the working group and task forces. Uh, colleagues. There are the working groups are the assessment, measurement, and uh, evidence working group, the advocacy working group, the child protection minimum standards working group, and the learning and development working group. While the task forces are, and I'll need to look them up so that I don't forget any of them, the case management task force, the child, uh, the community level approaches. Um, Task force, the child labor task force, family strengthening task force, the children associated with armed forces and armed group task force, then accompanied and separated children task force, and um, soon to be reactivated the cash um, task force. So these are the various groups that um, the alliance is made of beyond the secretariat and coordinators. And um, to go fast into the flow of this session because we have back-to-back -back input from all of like the, the, the speakers, we will now hear from Michelle Banakin on prevention work. So over to you, Michelle, the floor is yours. Great, thanks so much, Elena. So I will try to keep to my time of four minutes. So if, uh, if you attended last year's annual meeting, you'll remember that the theme was prevention. And so we were very happy this year to release the primary prevention framework for child protection and humanitarian action. Um, this framework um, aims to provide humanitarian workers on key actions and considerations to apply in programming to prevent harm to children in humanitarian settings at a population level. Um, now, what do we mean by that? As a quick refresher for those of you who maybe haven't memorized uh, the presentations from last year, we are looking at preventing harm at the primary level, which means that we are targeting all children in a community or population. And this is the primary level, as opposed to secondary prevention, which works with, um, which targets groups of children at harm risk, at high risk for harmful outcomes, or tertiary prevention, which works with children who have already experienced a harmful outcome. So this framework very specifically if you can change the slide, please. Um, very specifically looks at the top of this upside down triangle where it says primary prevention. Um, next slide, please. Now, the prevention framework is organized according to the program cycle management. So it gives you key steps and considerations for each step of the program cycle from preparedness through monitoring, evaluation, and learning. Um, and it, um, these are not intended to provide a comprehensive guide to program cycle management, but rather how can you 
take a prevention prevention approach um, in a child protection programming and the each and the key considerations for each step along the way. Um, this uh, resource also, if you can go to the next slide, outlines the eight principles for effective primary prevention interventions. Um, from using a holistic multi-sector approach uh, to facilitating community ownership um, and to being child-centered and inclusive. Um, these are the eight principles that need to be integrated into all steps of the program cycle. And this makes for effective primary prevention interventions. Um, so, uh, and this resource is available in uh, Arabic, French, English, and Spanish on the Alliance website. Um, in addition to the prevention framework, which helps us uh, develop uh, preventive programming, implement uh, effective preventive programming, um, and evaluate that programming, we also have uh, developed uh, with the learning and development working group, or the learning and development working group has led the development of, sorry, Elena, I'm not trying, not trying to take credit for it. Um, and if you can go to the next slide. Um, they've developed a short introductory learning package to accompany the primary prevention framework. Uh, the learning package aims at strengthening participants overall understanding of primary prevention and child protection and humanitarian action. And it can be delivered in one day in a face to face modality or in three online sessions if delivered remotely. Um, both sets of instructions are included with a facilitator's guide. Um, the link to the learning package is in the chat. I believe one of our wonderful producers will be dropping it in there. Um, and you can reach out to the learning and development working group. Um, so to Elena or Katie with any questions on that. So we are hoping that you will find this primary prevention framework useful. And tomorrow, if you join us, we have some exciting news about what's up next for the prevention initiative. Thank you, and back to you, Elena. Wonderful, Michelle, and great timing. Um, I, if you don't see the link to the introductory learning package, it's because we have to make it available. So it will come shortly. Um, don't worry, it's gonna be on the website probably like before the annual meeting ends. But uh, let me now leave the floor to Amanda Brydon, who's the co-lead of the advocacy uh, working group. <laughs> Thanks, Elena. It's great to be here. I'm super excited to be part of the Hot Off the Press session. So in my four minutes, um, I want to put a spotlight on some recent research the Advocacy Working Group has been coordinating on child protection funding in humanitarian action. So there's a link there in the chat to explore more. Um, we know that, that child protection is, is critically underfunded and an ongoing issue. So this research seeks to track the trends, find out what's going on um, and showcase a little bit about what we as a sector are doing to try and combat um, and uplift child protection uh, with donors and with governments. And we know that humanitarian crises themselves are disproportionately affecting children. Um, and we also know um, the, the narrative is clear that um, throughout 2020, 2021, um, we saw a significant increase in child protection needs um, uh, and the climate crises as well have been impacting children at unprecedented scale, putting them at further protection risks, driving displacement, poverty and violence. So we were really pleased to be able to, to do a, a third um, iteration of this report and, and be publishing it this year. So what does it cover? Part one gives us the trends and updates on figures. So we've got that evidence base of child protection funding, both in humanitarian response plans and refugee response plans. And I should say it's a collaborative effort between Save the Children, uh, the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action, UNHCR, and the Child Protection Area of Responsibility as well. So um, that uh, everyone participated in collecting that data and analyzing the trends. And then the second part of the report looks at some of the areas um, to address greater funding and, and see that prioritization of child protection. So it goes into a bit of a narrative around localization, multiple sector and integrated programming, which we're gonna talk a little bit about later today, and also reflecting accurate targets, costs and needs in the child protection humanitarian space. 
So what did the report tell us? Uh, next slide. Essentially two things. So positively, we're seeing funding levels for child protection in standalone settings increase, which is great. And, and you know, three years of this advocacy, it, it's good to see it getting more profile. Um, we're also seeing improved data collection. So um, being able to, to capture that picture a little bit more clearly, although there's still ongoing challenges with that. But the main finding that um, we're still seeing across the board um, and going into 2022 is that the gap between the child protection needs and the funding received for these humanitarian responses really continued to grow alarmingly in 2021 and 2022. Sorry, 2020 and 2021. Um, so the funding's increasing, but not enough to be meeting those needs and across these different um, humanitarian crises. Um, and so there's a lot more work to be done, I guess, is the bottom line. Um, but we do know that, you know, there is an increasing profile of children in protection, that we're um, able to lean into this global space. And in terms of what happens next, we've got a call to action. So next slide with six key points of what needs to be tackled. Um, so this is a bit of an action plan for us as a humanitarian sector, but also for, for donors and governments to be tackling this gap between child protection funding um, and the response itself. So please do check out the report and happy to touch base with anyone if they have further questions. Back to you, Eleanor. Thanks a million, Amanda. That was very timely. And um, over now, I leave the floor now to Katie Robertson, who's co-leading the Learning and Development Working Group with me. Over to you, Katie. Thanks, Eleanor. Um, so we have two things to introduce from the LND Working Group. The first is the Child Protection in Humanitarian Action Frontliner Getting Started Learning Package. It's quite a long name. Um, the Frontliner's Learning Package has been finalized and it replaces the previous um, version from 2014, which was developed by the CPMS Working Group. So this package has been designed to rapidly onboard new members in the wake of new emergencies or crises, and it aims to ensure that frontline workers are introduced to the minimum competencies to work in a safe, effective, accountable and professional way with children, families and communities. It's been designed to be delivered in modules through both face-to-face -face and remote facilitation. Um, so for face-to-face, -face, it's, it's a three-day package, but can be split because of the modular design and, and delivered over a longer period of time if that's more appropriate for the team. Um, when it's remotely facilitated, we recommend delivering the course in a series of half-day sessions. And it's currently available in English, French, Spanish, Arabic, Polish, and Ukrainian. Um, and all of those are available on the Alliance website. And then the Child Protection in Humanitarian Action Learning Resource Mapping is a new, um, a new piece of work that, we, that we've been working on recently, where we've tried to pull together information on all of the available CPHA learning resources into, into one list, really. Um, so we've included learning packages, e-courses, and massive open online courses. So I'll say a little bit more what we mean by that. So learning packages, we're considering facilitated learning events, which bring a group of participants together, either in person or online via um, a video calling platform. E-courses, we mean learning modules and activities which learners can complete on their own, in their own time, using a computer or device. And then massive open online courses are open access, self-paced courses, which aim to reach a large audience and usually are completed over several weeks. Everything included in the mapping is freely available and at no cost to the learner. Um, and there's three ways really that we think that this will be useful. We hope so. Um, Firstly, it helps us to better understand the, what we already have available and the gaps in the CPHA learning offer so we can guide recommendations for future investments. Um, it will hopefully help to avoid duplication of efforts so we have a, a clearer picture of what already exists. And it's helpful for keeping track of, of what, what may be due is due for updating or might need translating. So um, again, it's available via the Alliance website, and we encourage you to, to use it if you're planning to 
develop any new CPHA learning resources. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. And um, now we're going to hear uh, from, uh, actually, we're not, Colleen Fitzgerald is not present because she was deployed to the Ukrainian response to Poland, if I'm correct. And our lovely production team will now play a video recording of Colleen that uh, will speak about um, the uh, community, and volu community volunteer toolkit and training guide. So production, if you can play the video. Here we go. They are our neighbors, a friend, a listener, an interpreter, a guide. They notice when we are facing problems and are the first ones to respond. They open doors for us and as we go to new places, they are right there with us, by our side. They are appreciated in our community, working all day long for children like us. They understand and advise us. They encourage and support us. Sometimes they take risks for us. They are our translators and interpreters when no one understands. They help us solve problems. They listen to us in confidence and trust. They are beside us so we can be brave. They help us stay safe. They are far more than neighbors to us. They look after us, empower and protect us. They value us and we value them. This year, more than ever, volunteers have played a vital role on the front line of child protection. For those of us working in humanitarian settings, we know that volunteers are essential. Volunteers are the bridge between children and families affected by the emergency and child protection organizations. And we couldn't do our work without them. <clears throat> At the same time, we also know that very often the roles and responsibilities of volunteers are unclear. And this is especially the case when it comes to case management. Further, we know that volunteers are working very long hours very often for very limited remuneration or incentives. And this is a very complicated situation. To address this complexity, we, uh, as the Alliance, created uh, a new global interagency resource, the Toolkit for Community Child Protection Volunteers and Associated Training Manual. These resources focus specifically on the roles of community volunteers linked to case management but there also might be a lot of information and guidance within the toolkit and training manual that might be helpful for organizations working with volunteers and other roles and capacities. Within the toolkit, uh, we have established ethical standards for the roles and responsibilities of volunteers. We have outlined very clearly that the role of a caseworker is only for paid staff. Volunteers, however, play a very essential supplementary role in identifying and referring children as well as accompanying children to services and very often, very often interpreting for caseworkers and children within the case management process. It is the responsibility of child protection organizations to offer ongoing training, supervision, and support to volunteers uh, and to really be clear on the hours that they're meant to work and offering fair remuneration for those hours. Finally, it is the responsibility of child protection organizations to ensure the safety and well-being of volunteers in their roles, as we know that very often it can be very complicated and they're facing many risks within the community. Within the toolkit, we have some really practical tools that are in Word documents, so they're very easily adaptable and they're templates and just meant to be very functional and ready to use now. <laughs> so there's a volunteer role description that is really uh, practical and clear. There's a code of conduct template, safety and well-being checklist, a volunteer selection tool, a budget checklist, and many other tools that we hope will be really um, useful and helpful in your work directly with community volunteers. Furthermore, within the training manual, there are three core parts. The first part is really focusing on uh, guiding volunteers to understand their motivations and understand their community. And from there, uh, establishing their roles within child protection and case management more specifically. Uh, also in that first session, we have uh, 
guidance on safety and well being for volunteers, as well as how to best work as a team. There are also training sessions uh, on communication with children and families, as well as sessions on how to manage power dynamics within the community. Finally, in the third part, there are sessions that are meant for the case management team and volunteers to come together and to talk about best ways to collaborate in order to support children and families within case management. I'm very happy to share that these resources are available on the Alliance website currently in English and French. Uh, we will drop the link in the chat now. Uh, and we're getting the toolkit and training manual also translated into Arabic and Spanish. And that should be ready, I think, next month. Finally, we are working on a proposal right now where we are hoping to get funding from, uh, from a donor in order to uh, disseminate these resources. We're hoping to have two global training of trainers um, in which members of the Alliance can join us and we will train you on the toolkit and training manual that you then can bring back to your teams and colleagues um, at the country level. So please stay tuned on the Alliance website for more information about that, hopefully this fall. Thank you so much for your time today, and I wish you all the best with the Alliance meeting. Uh, back to me. Thanks to Colleen, who could not be here with us today. And now I leave the floor to Giovanna Vio, who is the Children and Associ Children Associated with Armed Forces and Armed Groups uh, Task Force co-lead. Um, Giovanna, the floor is yours, and the presentation will be up in a minute. Thank you, Elena, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so this year, the CAFAC Task Force has launched a few resources, and we've chosen two to talk about today. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. The first is the um, CAFAC Program Development Toolkit, which was developed by Plan International and UNICEF in 2021 and was launched this year. The toolkit is now available on the Alliance's website and um, available in the four main languages, English, French, Spanish and Arabic. The toolkit includes guidelines on how to develop um, quality and gender sensitive programs for um, CAFAC, a training package, as well as tools to contextualize. Um, before it was finalized, the toolkit was um, tested in four countries, and the four countries are um, Burkina Faso, Central African Republic, Afghanistan, partially, and Iraq. And in each of these countries, we were able to conduct um, a context analysis. Um, we implemented a five-day training for field practitioners, and later on, Plan International provided remote technical support. The context analysis included um, a risk assessment, a gender analysis, a needs assessment, um, a stakeholder analysis, and also some guidance on how to conduct consultations with former children associated with armed forces and armed groups. Um, the context analysis also um, is very important because allows field practitioners to have a comprehensive understanding of the situation of recruitment, as well as to know more about the trends in ex armed forces and armed groups, as well as to find out more about the challenges that children face in their integration. Um, and following the launch, we started planning the next phase, which is the rollout phase, and we selected three countries for, for the rollout process. And the countries are Mozambique, Colombia, and um, Nigeria. Um, still the, the, the slide before, <laughs> thanks. And um, the rollout phase will include um, a context analysis, um, some additional training, technical support, and will uh, end in early 2023 with an outcome measurement framework, which will help, um, help us gather information on how the rollout has gone, as well as to know more information about the quality of programs and, um, and gen gender sensitivity and also child participation and how they've been reflected in the rollout. Um, the next um, resource, which is this one that you've been seeing, is the operational guidance on negotiating and implementing handover protocols for the transfer of um, CAFAG again. And this guidance was developed by Watchlist and launched also in, in 2022, in March specifically. And it's, um, it's a guidance that um, provides um, field practitioners with practical tools and uh, good practices to support um, the development, signing and implementation of um, handover protocols. It also gives um, information on previous and ongoing negotiations 
and on, and on implementation of handover processes in various countries. Um, moreover, the operational guidance seeks to support child protection actors and practitioners to do several things, um, including initiating and navigating strate strategically through handover protocol negotiations. Um, it helps them um, try to promote the release of um, CAFA who are in detention and advocate for the improvement of standards for their persecution, as well as to um, uh, support them in trying to strengthen the implementation of handover agreements. And um, this is all from me. Thank you. Um, and back to Elena. Thanks a million, Giovanna. That was great um, to hear. And now, last but not least, Simon is co-leading the Child Labor Task Force. Over to you, Simon. Thanks, Elena. Hi, everyone. And uh, thanks for joining. Let me just uh, post in the chat. So the Child Labour Task Force um, for this year has two items for hot of the press. We have the um, MENA version of the Child Labour Toolkit, which was launched last year. Um, the MENA version, I think we're just waiting on a cover page, but can be found at the, Alliance, the Child Labour Task Force website, or soon will be. And then the second item we have is the um, online training package for the CPMS 12, which has been developed online and can be um, accessed as well on the link that I have shared. Um, so again, both of these resources are available and can be seen um, from the Child Labour Task Force uh, page. So I do encourage you to check those out, plus the other resources we have available or the um, case studies as well from the toolkit. And um, we're also trying to um, proceed with rollout of, of the toolkit in um, other countries as well and looking how we can support Child Labour Task Force members in using the uh, toolkit effectively in their regions. But um, I will keep it short and sweet. So there you go. Thank you. I knew you were going to you were gonna be short and sweet Simon I will count on you to rescue, rescue the timing of the session thanks a million so all of these resources that have been shared I understand there's quite a lot but it's too broke you know it's um the, the out of the press session was an occasion to showcase the amount of work that has been ongoing at the alliance level everything is available on our website and if you don't find something you can always try to us like and ask away uh, for whatever resource you are looking for um I would encourage everyone now, I would first of all, let me thank all of the speakers that contributed to the out of the press sessions. You have been wonderful with timekeeping and everything. Thank you so much. Uh, you're welcome to stay on. Uh, otherwise, we can spotlight the speakers for the next um, uh, part of the sessions, which is the uh, table talk. <laughs> uh, but before we go into that, I would like you all, and I'll would encourage you all to do so. To please stretch your arms, stretch like in whatever format you want to <laughs> go because you need to move to be able to be paying attention. Great, so get that oxygen flowing a little bit into your system so that you can truly focus because the table talk is an occasion to get to meet, um, to meet us, the Alliance team, and to talk to us, like with this session in particular is more focused on multi-sector and integrated programming. And we'll be hearing about, you know, on this, like from a few colleagues um, that are present today. Uh, so first of all, before we dive straight in into this session, there should be a link that the production company will share in the chat. And it's about, it's asking you, it's a question that asks basically, why do you think it's important to talk about multi-sector and integrated programming? And we're keen to hear your thoughts, like in a few words, like in a short sentence, in a word or something like that. So um, the producer will share the link in a minute. In the meantime, we will get like our lovely speakers to introduce themselves so we get to know them a bit more. And um, um, yeah, so I just uh, would like to leave the floor first to Chiara. 
Chiara, if you want to come off mute and introduce yourself. Thank you, Ellen, and uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Chiara Cerriosi, and I'm uh, here as a co-lead of uh, the working group of the Alliance on uh, Child Protection Minimum Standards, uh, which I co-lead with my colleague, uh, Joanna Wedge. Back to you, Elena. Thank you, Chiara. And I think the link has not gone through the chat, so don't worry about that like for a second. But let me uh, get Sylvia to introduce herself. Like, Sylvia, do you want to come on video, please? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Elena. I hope like, everyone can hear me and see me on the video. My name is Sylvia mm -hmm. Oñate. I work uh, with Plan International. I'm one of the colleagues of the Child Labor Task Force, together with Simon Hills, who just presented on uh, during the Hall of the Press. Nice to see everyone. Thank you, Silvia. So the Menti link is now in the chat, so you can now click on the link and answer with your few words, one word, like a sentence or what do you, why do you think multi-sector and integrated programming is important? We have introduced Chiara and Silvia. It's now Amanda's turn to come on. Amanda, the floor is yours. Thanks, Elena. Kia ora, everybody. Um, my name is Amanda Bryden. I am the co-lead for the Advocacy Working Group alongside uh, Ritu Bata and Faith Nermina as well. Nice to be here. Thanks, Amanda. And last but not least, Sandra Mignan. Sandra. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Sandra Mignon. I work with Plan International as a CAFAG advisor, and I'm also the co-lead of the CAFAG task force along with Giovanna, which uh, you just heard from. Thank you, back to you, Elena. <coughs> okay, I think I think there has been a bit of a mess up with the mentoring, which is not why multi-sector and integrated programming is important about where you are on the map. But what we will do, let us see where you are in the map, like production company, like Julie and our lovely producers, don't worry, like we can still hear from the group. Uh -oh. Okay, so I see that answers are coming up. Slowly but steadily, like the map will continue to generate itself. In the meantime, given that we have not used the mental link on why multi-sector and integrated programming is important, maybe Amanda, you can help us frame it like for the alliance. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think from my perspective and, and thinking about why it's so important. I mean, we all know we can't achieve children's protection through just one sector. Um, we also know that children experience life uh, or they don't experience life through different silos. So I really think for us, I'm excited about the session because for us to reach our vision to ensure children are protected, we really must be working together across sectors. And we know that's going to be better outcomes for children as well. Awesome, Amanda. I think that frames it quite well for the Alliance and more broadly for the sector as well. So I see that there is like a varied distribution of ourselves like across the map um, and you can see it like for yourself. But let us dive straight in. Um, so through ta throughout this table talk, we are going to be recording the potential questions that you would like to ask, like, and please use the chat like, to send them through. We will keep note of them and we will um, take time a bit later like, to actually address them. So do write down questions you have for us and no, no question is a stupid question. We are here to talk to you, really, like not to just hear our voices. So um, in the meantime, though, I think I would like to ask like our speakers today uh, to tell us a little bit of what they are doing or what they have uh, um, achieved and accomplished so far in terms of multi-sector and integrated programming within their uh, working group and task forces at the Alliance. And I think, um, Chiara, do you want to go first, like with this question? Sure. Um, thank you, Verena. Uh, talking about the Child Protection Minimum Standard Working Group, uh, we have a focus on uh, how to leverage uh, uh, Pillar 4 of the Minimum Standards to promote the centrality of uh, children uh, protection and well-being across uh, uh, sectors. Uh, we have uh, several ongoing uh, activities uh, that go from uh, strengthening uh, evidence, uh, development of uh, learning packages, 
uh, development and testing of uh, practical uh, tools uh, with some uh, countries. Uh, and uh, just to say that uh, all of these uh, initiative, uh, uh, initiatives so far have seen the close uh, engagement of uh, key members of uh, the working group, uh, like, for instance, the Global Child Protection Area of uh, Responsibilities, uh, INGOs such as the Plan International and Save the Children, uh, and also closely working with uh, UNHCR. Uh, just maybe to highlight one thing is that in the end of 2021, we ran extensive uh, consultations, uh, which saw the participation of about 400 stakeholders from across all sectors, regions, uh, covering voices from local actors, international NGOs, and the UN agencies. Uh, in these uh, consultations, a more in-depth engagement was uh, undertaken with the uh, colleagues uh, from uh, health, education, food security, and the camp coordination and the camp management. The central aim of the consultation was uh, to listen to actors from other sectors operating in uh, humanitarian, refugee, and uh, mixed uh, settings. Uh, to understand from them what are the barriers, uh, the opportunities, uh, and the priorities for uh, working together. Uh, now, after a few months, as a result, we have uh, uh, developed an intersectoral framework, which gives us uh, a collective sphere for centering children and their protection needs across uh, sectors. Uh, the framework identifies a number of uh, key areas where we would need to focus moving forward to make progress towards uh, our vision of a humanitarian action where uh, children's protection and well-being are institutionalized as a core commitment by all humanitarian actors and across the sectors. And now just to mention that these are key areas that were uh, uh, agreed with other sectors include building a common language and understanding, uh, building on competencies, uh, on uh, standards, uh, on practical tools, uh, joint advocacy, build on evidence and learning, and coordination and collaboration. And over to you, Elena, thanks. Oh, that's great, Chiara. And um, great that you highlighted that members have um, you know, a possibility to contribute to, to all of these pieces of work. Uh, I think that's essential to understand that as a member, you have a possibility to engage with all of like the work of the Alliance. And um, Sylvia, do you want to come on on this uh, question around what um, the Child Labour Task Force has been uh, accomplishing on multi-sector and integrated programming or maybe do you have like successful case studies that you have um that you can share so over to you Kate, mm -hmm. thank you lena maybe just like to start i want to highlight like it's very relevant what like amanda mentioned because like actually the complex nature of child labor requires like you know we know that already like requires coordination of like different actors, development humanitarian, but also across sectors. So child protection actors, like we play a central role and we know that, but also actors across many other sectors, like education, health, food security and livelihood, like and many other sectors like need to prioritize the issue of child labor if we are actually to effectively prevent and respond child labor. Uh, and that's why I want to highlight the example from the, the Child Labor Task Force that we have developed the interagency toolkit for preventing and responding to child labor in humanitarian action, um, which offers like a strong global commitment to address child labor in humanitarian action. And this is an example of uh, interagency collaboration, but also uh, intersectoral collaboration that involves many, uh, I believe it's like over 150 uh, individuals actually, over like 30 agencies from different sectors worldwide that help develop also like test guidance and the tools and, you know, collect the best practice. And this toolkit is for practitioners uh, from child protection, but also other sectors that are responsible for child labor strategy uh, design and implementation. 
And within the toolkit, you could see that there is a programmatic framework for child labor, which includes like multi-level interventions. So at the different uh, socio-ecological levels, but also includes like multi-sectoral uh, prevention and response actions. So specific uh, response actions for each sector. Um, and then the company learning package also targets practitioners from different sectors and has like sample agendas and sessions for different um, different sectors. So this is how, you know, core and important for, for child labor, but also like for the child labor task force, uh, the multi-sectoral component. And maybe to mention a few examples, you mentioned like if we have like case studies or practical tools, um, we actually have uh, several examples, uh, but I know like we are um, limited on time. So I want to mention, we have actually strongly collaborated with the food security and livelihood sector last year. Um, so we developed a paper called Reducing Child Labor uh, in Agriculture uh, in Humanitarian um, Crisis, uh, which we launched and we had a side event during the Global FAO Conference last year on ending child labor agriculture in agriculture. Um, but also there are several case studies of so programming uh, practices that have been documented um, and I wanted to highlight two, but there are more. So one is around multi-sectoral services for street and working children uh, in Lebanon. Uh, and that was like a response for um, the crisis in Syria. Um, and there's a program that provides case management and also comprehensive child protection services. Um, and the program included like a static and mobile services, um, also multi-sectoral, uh, but also work with employers, uh, focus on supporting working children, accesses to learning and education. Um, so that's one example. And the other example actually inside Syria is an integrated child protection, uh, wash uh, and cash for work to address child labor among adolescents, um, so older adolescents. And this was like innovative program uh, that was developed by, um, in collaboration uh, with like WASH and, um, and child protection colleagues after recognizing that there was like a programming gap for all the adolescents. So the, the gap was in terms of lack of alternative sources of income. So the solution was, um, older adolescents with economic opportunities with the ongoing humanitarian wash program and you can read more about these two successful uh, program examples and have more information about the resources uh, in the toolkit I'll share also the microsite um, as well to mention that there are like several uh, practical tools which actually promote uh, multi-sectoral collaboration um, and they are like, you know, can be used by different sectors. And those include, for example, uh, signs of child labor, which, you know, all humanitarian actors should know to identify and be able to refer, uh, but also a, a practical tool called what we need to know uh, on child labor, which presents the different pieces of information uh, or child labor key messages for children, families, communities, employers that can be adapted in different contexts, but that are relevant for all sectors working directly with these groups. Um, so I'm going to stop here, but um, over to you, Elena, and I'll share the, the link uh, in the chat and yeah, over to you. Yeah, I think there is a comment around mining, child labor issues in mining somewhere. Maybe you can see if you have anything specific to share, Silvia. And um, Amanda, um, have we done something in particular like already around advocacy and multi-sector and integrated programming? Yes, so um, I think one of the things that would be good to highlight um, that the advocacy working group has done is um, for those that were in the hot of the press session um, where we talked about the unprotected research is that we've found from the 
um, the tracking of child protection funding. It's not only looking at standalone, but we also do a, a segment of uh, child protection in multiple sector and integrated programming as well. And there's a lot of challenges with the funding and tracking system about how we measure where child protection is in other sectors. But what we've seen in the three different reports is that that funding is increasing and we're getting better at tracking where child protection is in or where the funding um, and programming interventions are in other sectors like wider protection, education and GBV as well. Right, great, Amanda. I think you know this gives an idea of like the ongoing initiatives within the alliance. Maybe it's worth exploring before we dive more into the questions uh, that you may have. Uh, what is in the pipeline uh, from the from the alliance working group and task forces? So, Sandra, do you want to come in uh, first? And tell us what the children um, and uh, children associated with town forces and groups task forces are up to. Yes, sure. So yes, as a CAFAC task force, we're currently working on the development of two cross sector guidance notes. So these um, aim to promote the collaboration with other sectors to better prevent recruitment of children and to address the needs of CAFAG, particularly during their reintegration. So for that, we have conducted an online survey where about 45 practitioners um, responded. And then the, the outcome of this survey is that people selected two key sectors that they would like us to focus on for those uh, guidance notes. So the sectors are education and livelihood. And so we, we plan now to develop those guidance notes uh, in collaboration with the relevant sector. And we will focus on validating common language and terms with a focus on more action terms and less jargon. And I saw there was actually a comment in the chat about this. So this is the plan. We know that there is we're all different, we're calling same things differently or like this, you know, the lot of jargon that we have in the child protection sector is not always well understood from uh, the other sectors. So just to have like this kind of common base of uh, common understanding of those key terms. Then uh, we will identify areas of common interest and challenges to address. So like on the way we're working on how we implementing programs and so on. And then in the end, we hope to have like this very short, simple, practical guidance um, that we, um, we will share with, uh, with the sectors, with the, um, the relevant sector and within the child protection practitioners as well. And this guidance will include a shared framework with common indicators and outcomes. And that's really how we want to frame it. We want to frame it around outcomes because it's easier than this is what do we want to achieve? And then how do we pull resources to achieve those outcomes? And it's an easier way of working. Uh, we also want to include some case studies and some practical recommendations. So that's what we have in a pipeline for the CAFAC task force. It sounds very interesting. Um, and in terms of um, um, upcoming work, I think there is the whole work stream um, that um, the CPMS working group has got going. So maybe um, Chiara, do you wanna explain what have you got in the pipeline? Cause there might be tools which are gonna be useful to many. Yes, uh, we have a few pieces of work that we really want on different work streams, uh, but where the common thread is uh, that we want to co-develop and co-work with other sectors uh, representatives. Uh, some of this work is around awareness and learning. So we are uh, co-developing with uh, food security and education actors, two new videos on uh, pillar four of the minimum standards uh, that want to illustrate why to work uh, uh, together and showing uh, good examples of uh, program integration. Uh, the videos in English should be ready by August and uh, they will be then translated in the following months uh, in French, Spanish and Arabic. 
Uh, we are also co-developing three new e-modules uh, on Pillar 4 uh, with the food security, camp coordination and camp management, uh, and later with the health. And these new e-modules will be part of the free online uh, e-course on the child protection minimum standards. And then still on the learning, I wanted to highlight one initiative that um, uh, we will uh, benefit from and is uh, led by the global child protection area of uh, responsibility on the development of uh, global workshop uh, packages uh, that cover child protection mainstreaming, uh, uh, child safeguarding, uh, participation and the safe identification and uh, referrals. Uh, we will uh, finalize the work around uh, uh, building some evidence or at least some qualitative uh, reviews of uh, good examples of a uh, program integration and uh, missed opportunities for uh, collaboration between uh, child protection and uh, education and also with the uh, health uh, camp management uh, and uh, under plan international leadership with uh, food security. Uh, then we will focus uh, uh, between the summer and the autumn uh, to work with uh, five uh, pilot countries uh, on the development and the testing of uh, operational uh, tools uh, co-developed with uh, country-based practitioners from uh, uh, other sectors. And uh, finally, we are working closely with the UNHCR uh, and with a full-time uh, uh, child protection mainstreaming specialist uh, who is seconded to their child protection unit to help uh, uh, strengthen the child protection outlook uh, across uh, policies, guidance, uh, and uh, refugee response plans. Thanks, Chiara. I think one of the key things that I'm seeing like across the various contribution is that we have shifted from thinking or working across sector, but thinking about our own practitioners, but really working with the colleagues from the other sectors. And Amanda, maybe you want to tell us a little bit what's in the pipeline for the, for the advocacy working group, so to support like, you know, this engagement like, with other sectors. Yeah, very much so. So with the advocacy working group, we've got a new advocacy strategy aligning with the overall Alliance One. And corresponding to that, we've revised our work plan, which now has a standalone objective on multi-sector and integrated programming advocacy work. So maybe three uh, key highlights um, in the pipeline in that work plan. One is related to what Chiara was just talking about, so that exciting collaboration with the Global Child Protection Area of Responsibility, with PLAN International, um, uh, and with the leadership of the CPMS Working Group, that gathering of evidence of successes and good examples of integration and missed opportunities as an advocacy working group, we can really review those and support in the use of advocacy. So amplifying the key messages um, and the calls across our different networks, um, as well as to key direct targets like donors and decision makers, um, and really promoting the, the importance and the added value of this um, collaborative work and a holistic approach to, to child protection work. A second one um, which I'm really excited about is advocacy support for some research on the impacts of school closures on children's protection. So that launch is going to be later on this afternoon of that research work within the Alliance and um, taking that report forward so it's not just a launch and that's it. Um, we're working with colleagues at Protectnon and others um, to formulate a series of global roundtables, um, including with the local and national organizations that helped lead the research from Colombia, DRC, and Lebanon, as well as with children and young people and with humanitarian actors, practitioners, and donors to discuss the findings, see where that intersection of issues are between child protection, education, and health, and then how as a sector um, and individually, we can be taking forward those recommendations to better prepare um, and ensure children's protection in the hopefully not another soon pandemic. Um, and then the, the last one I think uh, that I think will be really great for the advocacy working group is to hold a, a series of consultations with others on understanding more in depth the barriers to, to working with the child protection sector and understanding some of the current challenges. 
uh, Sandra and, and others in the chat have mentioned um, use of jargon and language. Um, so some advocacy work to explore where those barriers are talking with colleagues like uh, those in the gender based violence sector or MHBSS sector to understand you know, where they have been successful in driving issues up the agenda and, and mainstreaming across sectors and packaging up those lessons learned to help guide how we take this forward in the sector as well. So happy to, to touch base with people if they'd like more information or also want to get involved. Back to you, Eleanor. So it seems like there are still a lot of challenges like to be overtaken, to be able to accomplish this goal, which is another very ambitious goal that um, the Alliance has set for itself. Um, more generally, so going beyond like even what your working group and task forces are doing, Sandra, what do you think are the critical changes that we should see in the sector to achieve um, the goal for this priority. Yeah, um, it's a when, difficult question. <laughs> yes, yes, no, but like when we did the survey, this online survey, we also asked uh, practitioners what were some successes and challenges and things to change. Uh, and one thing that came out was was interesting. Um, and it's something that I've seen also in my practice in the field. I think there is a need for more humility on the side of child protection actors. And I, we see typically with CAFAC programming uh, where we do reintegration programs for, for those children, where child protection actors implement livelihood activities, they implement education activities without necessarily the technical background uh, needed. And in some cases, not always, but like this may lead to some poor quality of programming. And I will give you an example. Um, often we see those livelihood programs where we train those children in vocational training and where we train them in trades that are not based and are not identified uh, based on a market assessment, but they're only identified based on the availability of trainers in the location where children live. Or um, we see that there is no proper follow-up, like children are trained and then right after there is no additional support to these children. So this is just to say that sometimes we need to recognize that we don't have the whole expertise to do everything. And that other organizations may have more expertise in this field. This is their field of work. Um, so sometimes you have that expertise within your own organization or sometimes you need to go out and, and seek support from other, other experts. So the idea for me is not to oppose one sector to the other and saying, we are the experts, you can't touch it, but rather to collaborate to achieve the outcome. And it's coming back to this idea of outcome. What do we want to achieve? And then in this case, we want children to make a living with um, their livelihood activity. We want them to be autonomous financially. And to achieve that, we need to pull the, the experience and expertise from, from both sectors. We also know that sometimes CAFAG um, may display aggressive behaviors, that it's difficult to build trust with them. And this is where child protection actors have this added value, right? So like it's working together to achieve an outcome. And sometimes uh, we just need to acknowledge that this is we're not going to lose power, we're not going to lose, you know, funding, but it's really to achieve better, better outcomes. So that will be my, my suggestion. Great, it's a great suggestion and that, that um, conversation with the other sector needs to improve. And uh, Sylvia, any thoughts from your side on the critical changes you think the sector should make to, to reach this goal? Thank you, Elena. A lot of food for thought from Sandra. Um, I was just thinking um, that might be like, you know, four key areas that can be strengthened when we think about like, you know, multi-sectoral, um, you know, thinking uh, also specifically on child labor. Uh, so one that we know is very key is the component of coordination. 
of the child labor in the you know in the response, which is like you know in a like an essential component for the effective child labor response. Um, so, for example, we have been supporting like you know, recent like child labor task forces at national level uh, in Jordan uh, and in other countries where they can push for like some of the key areas needed like uh, preparedness, having like data and info management, a strategic planning, et cetera. Uh, and one of the key actions there is to decide on the suitable coordination structure. Um, and some example, uh, in some cases, is about like multiple sectors jointly leading uh, an intersectoral child labor coordination mechanism. So this is an area that, you know, that can be further strengthen and where like you no know, child protection can also like you no know, reach out to other sectors to have uh, a suitable coordination uh, structure. And other area is around situation analysis and assessment, um, where we know that integrating child labor into assessment across different sectors is more cost effective um, and also can contribute to having a more like diverse and comprehensive picture of child labor like you no know, characteristics and trends uh, and also it can help us to bring that ownership uh, for the multiple sectors to identify key actions for different sectors so that's also like where we see like um, opportunities to include like child labor in assessment frameworks for other sectors uh, and when doing so uh, we think it's very important to develop like a harmonized approach between all actors involved. So there's a common like you know key indicators, uh, and then the analysis can be you know shared um, and interpreted as well. Um, the third area then is about like then the response planning, the strategic response planning, and this is like linked to what like Sandra mentioned about you know, involving relevant humanitarian sectors uh, and then child labor actors in the context, which can vary from child protection, but also education in the case of child labor also like, you know, important to have food security and livelihood, health, um, and then recognizing that individual agencies and also the humanitarian sector uh, coordination groups have to carefully assess mandate, but also capacity to prevent and respond to child labor. And in some cases can be to strengthen linkages, in some cases to provide like specialized services, uh, but it has to be like that uh, exercise to have a joint uh, response planning. And maybe my last point, um, which I think can be further strengthened as a critical action is regarding resource mobilization. Uh, for dedicated funding. In the case of child labor, we see that many times it's very challenging to actually access, um, you know, funding even when we have like you no know, um, evidence on the magnitude and the severity of child labor. So key actions could be also to collaborate uh, with other sectors to mobilize funding, but also to integrate the child labor actions into broader sector response uh, strategies. Um, and then to do like some joint advocacy and there are several tools and several key actions included actually in our toolkit that can help uh, in terms of like tips. Um, so again, we're happy to support if anyone has any, you know, any ideas or any requests, uh, but those are like kind of the four areas where we think that can continue advancing in order to, to have um, a quality multi-sectoral response. Thanks, Steve. And please everyone, you can, um send your thoughts, like your questions, your doubts, like in the chat, we will have some time after the next question to respond like to them. We have already a few that uh, I have lined up as we were talking. Certainly funding represents a challenge for multi-sector and integrated programming and for the sector more generally or for humanitarian aid more generally going forward. But uh, as the history of the sector has not been uh, in our favor in terms of um, this. But I have like one question which walked away from this, but rather um, I was thinking on, you know, because our priorities within the Alliance is the centrality of the protection and with that, the accountability to children. So I was 
you know, I was thinking a little bit like, oh, now we build that link between multi-sector and integrated programming and accountability. Like, so can multi-sector and integrated programming help us achieve better accountability to children? And I'm gonna drop this difficult question um, for the speakers to address. Chiara, do you wanna come in on this one? Yes, I'll, I'll try and uh, maybe taking it um from a bit of a broad introduction, but uh, I think children uh, protection is uh, intrinsically linked to existing humanitarian uh, commitments and principles, uh, which include accountability, uh, together, of course, with uh, other commitments like uh, inclusion, uh, participation, uh, centrality of protection, and uh, so on. Um, the child protection minimum standards uh, give us the opportunity uh, not only to have a solid foundation for uh, practical action to prevent uh, risks and harms affecting children, but also 10 years after their launch, they remain our sector main joint tool for accountability to children. And when we talk of accountability, we cannot avoid talking of participation and how child participation is a key. Uh, to reach uh, full uh, accountability. And the participation is uh, one of uh, the 10, uh, of our 10 sectoral uh, uh, principles. And um, we really need to challenge uh, ourselves uh, in a critical way to see how to live up to it when uh, uh, programming or when using the child protection minimum standards for uh, programming. And, uh, investing in uh, meaningful uh, and uh, equitable uh, participation of uh, children through uh, multi-sectoral or uh, integrated uh, programming will eventually take us uh, to a humanitarian action that uh, uh, considers uh, actively risks to children to prevent uh, harming them through our action but is also accountable uh, to them. And the uh, talking of um, uh, integrated uh, programming, uh, I think also tools like um, um, investing more on a joint uh, analysis, uh, joint planning uh, that incorporate the views uh, of uh, children and more broadly affected population, uh, as well as uh, adopting a collective uh, approach to gather uh, and address uh, feedback. Uh, uh, will support our path towards uh, achieving accountability. Um, I see Edspeth says, great question. I have to say great answer, Chiara. I think that was the best way we could put it, like uh, working towards like a humanitarian response that really like addresses those risks to children or that takes those as a priority. It's cool. Any others of like the, the speakers that would like to add a point to this? I am conscious that you might want to add. If not, we have a few questions coming through um, uh, through the chat that we can take in turns. Um, one of the first actually question and comment that has come through actually speaks fondly of the CPMS, which you will be pleased to hear, Chiara and everyone. Definitions and terminology, says David. I sometimes find in working across sectors with other specialist technical advisors that we often use the terminology of mainstreaming, joint programming and integration in very different ways as it's human. And it also now we do this more effectively. One thing that I've found helpful is very good, it's a very good log frame example in the CPMS making these distinctions and using this to develop other examples and share those in various forums with colleagues. Other good examples from the panel in operationalizing the guidance in pillar four of the CPMS. So the question is around definition and terminology and how do we make this easier? Anyone who wants to take this? Chiara, I feel, I feel I should call you because the CPMS is mentioned, but uh, <laughs> anyone else is welcome to answer this question. Yeah, and uh, maybe to, to share, uh, uh, I don't think I have an answer, a full answer for uh, David, uh, but just to confirm that in uh, these uh, consultations uh, we run uh, with the stakeholders from uh, other sectors uh, last winter, uh, 
actually this was a, a, one of the main points uh, and the suggested areas for our work for uh, us as a child protection sector. And so what came out from those consultations was exactly that um, these uh, process uh, terms like uh, mainstreaming, uh, integration, uh, joint working mm -hmm. are uh, a cause of uh, confusion. And uh, they are seen as uh, leading to misunderstandings and not uh, adding um, uh, much value. And this is also exacerbated when then these words are translated uh, into other uh, languages mm -hmm. where the exact uh, correspondent, uh, corresponding word does not exist. And so, for instance, one suggestion that came from other sectors uh, that uh, I think we should take in for a reflection was that instead, uh, um, protection link words word that they understand uh, um, much more clearly are, for instance, centrality of protection, safety, do no harm, inclusion, age and gender analysis. And so um, I think one of the areas that we, we would like to put forward for building this work on working across sectors is really to try to rethink uh, about the, the language and finding a common uh, yeah, a common language to communicate between uh, sectors. If we cannot even talk between each other, it's problematic, yeah. I hear. Um, I hope, David, that that answered your question a bit. I don't think we have uh, the magic wand, unfortunately. We're all in the same uh, boat on this one. Um, any, I don't know, Amanda, do you wanna? Yeah, thanks, Amanda, come in. I don't know if you saw my thinking face or not. Um, yeah. Maybe less on the the terminology, but I think one thing that I've seen and, and been reflecting on in terms of barriers and, and how we can approach this is, and it's a bit of a catch-22, that without the additional resources and with the challenges with resources and everyone being so frantic, um, you need time and you need human resource and people to be able to create that space to engage with other colleagues. And I think a big part of understanding the language is also understanding what other colleagues do and where the entry points are and where the synergies are and fit in. So I think a big part of our advocacy messaging is making sure there's the resources and the spaces and time to allow colleagues to have that cross fertilization and conversations at the right time and project development and proposals so that we can sort of see where those synergies are and, and how it fits in and then through that engagement and building relationships, you develop a common language together as well to take forward. So no solution, but but just a, a, a I guess a, a plea and thinking about the bigger picture of, of how important sort of resourcing mm. capacity is for, for colleagues in this space if we need to achieve what we need to. Thanks. Yes, Amanda. Um, Sandra, I see I don't know if you want to come in on this one around terminology. I guess CAFA has got also some lots of sensitivities associated with it, mm -hmm. the terminology. But I don't yes. know. Yes. Yeah, of course. Um just the term CAFAG is not understood by most people outside of the child protection sector. So, uh, but you know the history why we move from child soldiers to CAFAG. So it's like yeah, I think these are things that we're going to explore in our guidance notes as we work with other sectors and see how this is understood and and uh, maybe there is, you know, a bit of education and to understand, to explain why are we using this complex terminology, what is behind and um, and then it's working around, yeah, this common, I think it's I will bring it back always to the outcome. What do we want to achieve? And then from there, walking backwards on, on what we want to do, how we call things, and other sectors have their own jargon. So just making sure that we understand each other when we talk about, about certain things. I also wanted to add on the, the responsibilities of donors in this. Um, they also um, almost like, him, um, let's say, strengthening those silos, because even in their uh, call for proposal, it's always very siloed. The language is also very specific to one sector. And, and 
bringing those two sectors together is not always um, easy. And uh, we see, for example, if I take it back to the situation of CAFAG, where we're often in conflict settings, where we need to engage children into activities that are considered as development settings, like the um, uh, like livelihoods, for example. And so we have this conflict where donors don't even want to include those activities. They don't want to merge them into one project and to address comprehensively the needs of children. And I know for the child labor, it's, it's the same situation. You have a child, children don't really care about, you know, like if which sector this is about, like they have needs. And then it's all responsibility to meet those needs and then bring the different sectors around the table to um, to respond to these needs. So just few, yeah, no real answers, but more food for thought. <laughs> Lots of food for thought, in fact, Alexandra. Um, okay, another question that we've got, I'd like to turn this around a little bit because the question is around the role of the private sector supply chain is crucial. Are there promising practices to keep companies accountable, codes of conduct, certification, etc. And I was thinking to ask this to, to Silvia because you might have more to do with this type of issues like in child labor programming. Um, but also broaden the scope of this question a little bit to look at like you know what what you know what do private companies have like uh, to contribute potentially to multi-sector programming or in, an integrated programming if if there is anything that they can contribute. Over to you Silvia. Thank you Elena and thanks for the question. Uh, we have shared like several resources but then um, I've said to the colleague like you can reach out um, and we can put in touch with the specific examples. In our, as um, Sandra was mentioning, in order to tackle like child labor we also, you know, uh, we think about development actors, humanitarian actors, different sectors but also like very importantly like private sector um, in many cases to mitigate risks uh, but also in other cases as well to comply with code of conduct uh, and regulations. So it has like a key role uh, and many times as well in the prov provision of services. So in education, also in vocational training and others. So there's like several key actions on how to involve employers. So if I think about the, the different like from pre prevention, like preparedness, uh, even raising awareness. So even when we think about our learning uh, package as well, targets private sector. So in many, actually in many um, situation contexts, they have targeted private sector as well and included in the training on child labor, also to go through definitions, um, to explain like some key concepts, legal frameworks, in many cases might be also uh, about like awareness raising, but also there's a lot of like work with employers. Um, and there's, yeah, for sure, like you know, some examples of our child labor task force members have worked uh, on developing code of conduct and also ensuring having plans for the private companies. Um, to also that can contribute to uh, prevent, but also to respond uh, to child labor and specifically on like worst forms of child labor. So we have a couple of examples from a consortium that work in several countries in, in Africa on mining um, and other industries. Uh, and also our, I had to mention that there's one of our child labor task force members uh, Bank Information Center is also working a lot on engaging private sector. Um, so I'm um, also asking everyone who is like interested to further like develop this topic, also to join our uh, child labor task force, and we can like uh, further explore in our next calls. Um, I have to also say that ILO, who is the co-lead of the child labor task force, has developed several resources and has like a tremendous experience as well working with private sector uh, and different um, employers. So yeah, definitely like a key role uh, to play and a key target group to engage uh, if we are like to, yeah, to address this issue. Thanks, Silvia. So there are a couple of other questions in, that have come through the chat and that 
again we will look into the we we'll, we'll look into them but um, in the flavor of multi sector and integrated programming um, I don't remember who this came from. This is bad from my side. Um, and it says, the question says, I believe working with community leaders and build their capacity to support child protection mechanisms as parasocial workers and to raise community awareness is, is this approach on the plate with all sectors? So the question is around whether we are going to be working with community level um, units like on child protection and with the other sectors and i know this is not like a simple question so anyone who wants to come in on this one uh, sandra please come on yeah just quickly um when we did this survey this online survey someone mentioned that it's actually easier to coordinate at the local level at the community level with other sectors than at a higher level, like the cluster and so on. And so I found that a very interesting point. And, mm -hmm. and I do think indeed it's easier when you are at the community level, like the clinic is around the corner, then you have you know, this uh, community-based organization who is providing some services right there. So it's much easier to bring people around the table and say, you know, how can we address this issue um, then you know, in the capital, trying to organize a meeting with like cluster leads and, and everybody's busy and so on. So I think there is definitely a very strong entry point here to, to make it like practical and to make it work for the people in the end. So sometimes we don't necessarily have like this very fancy frameworks, you know, where it takes three years to agree on things <laughs> and to just go straight down to the community, bring people around the table and then get things done. So that's, uh, that's my point. I love your answer, Sandra, and I think it was a great question from Jacqueline. I just went back like and chat to share. Yes, maybe the secret to multi-sector and integrated programming is starting at the bottom. Anyone else who wants to jump in on this one? With some thoughts. I think the other question that we had. Uh, yeah, it, the other question that we received was actually on the same line, the establishment of community-based child protection community mechanism will go a long way in, pro in promoting child protection. Uh, so it was in the same line of this. Amanda, please go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to add on that to say in a very similar vein, I think efforts to bring children's participation and voices um, into consultations on, you know, preparation of programming and our advocacy work, children also don't see things in silos. Um, so taking that messages and their needs and, and bringing that into the thinking, planning and design, I think is a really good way to also be um, coming up with practical approaches for that multi-sector work as well. I think we have time for one, one last, last, uh, last, uh, last thought. Like, are there any lessons learned that uh, we can gather from, or that you have gathered so far from your interactions with other sectors? Is there anyone who's got examples so far? Silent. <laughs> I think it's a difficult one to wrap like in a couple of minutes. So we ah Sandra, you go ahead. Like. Yeah, um it's a it's a short one and it's within our experience of uh testing the CAFAG um the CAFAG toolkit that Giovanna talked about in uh, Heart of the Press. So we were rolling out this toolkit in, in various countries and and part of the approach to respond to CAFAG needs is, is multi-sector approach, obviously. We need to bring everyone, um, particularly for prevention, but also for reintegration. And we found that these are very, you know, always like top level, it's hard to materialize. And during one of the training, we managed to get the, the cluster lead for education in the room. And so we had an entire session. So we'll, our training was very focused on CAFAG, but the fact that we had that person during our training, um, I think it really helped to frame education. So on one side for the education sector to understand the specific needs of CAFAG, 
they do have specific needs and then we you know we need to accommodate those needs but also for us to understand like how how to provide education services that are also in line with the um, the standards of the education sector so like again bringing those two around the table and during the training i think it really helped that's one example thank you sandra i think we are at time we as from nepal uh, thank you i will not say stickers thank you to all my colleagues to all my team for joining like this session and i just would like to remind like everyone a few things first thanks to also all the participants for the comments the interaction i saw that there was also parallel discussions ongoing in the chat so coming up in the annual meeting you have uh, an infographic discussion so you can go on Philo and join an infographic discussion during this break and chat about uh, initiatives that have been presented through posters on the community of practice. There are also three additional sessions after that starting at uh, 45 past the hour. Um, on a variety of topics, but one is on working across sectors evidence reviews. So if you if your topic, if your preferred priority is multi-sector and integrated programming, you might want to check that out. But there are also two other very interesting uh, sessions on accountability to children and armed conflict, which I think Sandra might be on, and then uh, the anticipatory action for prevention working across sectors and to address climate crisis. Again, another super hot topic. So those are coming up. And um, tomorrow, there is going to be also a session on what's next for working group and task forces and another panel discussion of this kind on a different topic. So please join us. We are very happy to be able to meet with all of you and uh, exchange. Thanks, everyone, for the engagement once again. And have a lovely rest of the annual meeting. Thanks, Elena. Bye. See you soon. Thank Bye. you.